Listeners, readers, welcome back to part two of our three-part discussion of Elena Ferrante's The Lost Daughter. If you haven't listened to part one and you were planning on doing that, you might want to go back and do that before you dive into part two. At the end of part one, we were discussing a little bit about the proliferation of the names, the name of Lida in particular, and how that, that name proliferates. We're going to continue with that discussion today, talking more about how all of the different names proliferate, but then also about how mothers in the book, daughters, pregnancies, babies, dolls, all of these things are proliferating uh, in a way that's actually very significant. It's not just creepy, it's also significant. We'll get to the significance in the third part. We're then going to be talking about the creepiness and sort of the horror aspect of this novel, um, mostly psychological horror, but also some actual kind of gross creepiness, um, which I actually loved. It's funny, I am not a horror movie watcher, but I don't mind it um, when I don't have a visual of it. So it's, um, you know, up to you whether or not you want to dive into some horror. And it's not, it's not like, you know, slasher film or something, but it's, it's definitely, there are definitely some creepy little bits, which we will discuss. Okay, we're going to dive into this idea of proliferation. So we discussed in the first part this idea of Leda as um, proliferating in the sense that she gives birth to someone named Helen, but Helen is an, a version of uh, Elena. So you have this idea of, of the daughter of Leda as being uh, Elena in the same way that the daughter of Nina in the book is uh, her, her daughter is Elena. So you have all of these different echoes of mothers whose daughters are named Helen or Elena. The other interesting thing for me, and uh, we discussed in the first part about how Elena Ferrante has this, it's a pseudonym. We don't know, in fact, who she is. And I think it, that does something interesting for me in that she seems like kind of a generic person. Because I don't have a lot of biographical information about her, it's easier for me to see her as kind of a... Um, like a non-person. And then I think it allows you to, to, to not impose any biographical information, but just to take what is there. I think it also allows you to really conflate a first person narrator with Elena Ferrante. So in this case, this woman whose name is Leda, and Leda, you know, who gives birth to this Elena, essentially, you have this idea of Lida or Leda as also being Elena Ferrante, the author. I think it's very natural to sort of have a sense of, of, a, um, of a narrator and an author as being the same person. Obviously, they're not the same person, um, but it's very easy to make that slippage when you have someone, for example, who is writing in the first person and who is a woman and who is middle-aged and who has children. So it sort of does fit the very scant biological uh, data that we have about Elena Ferrante. Okay, then we have Nina, who is, she's played by Dakota, Dakota Fanning, by Dakota Johnson in, uh, in the movie by Maggie Gyllenhaal. But this Nina person is the, the mother, the young mother, she's I think 22. Uh, she had the baby when she was 19. The baby's now three years old. Her name is Nina. But we also find out about halfway through the novella that uh, when she was, when, when uh, Leda herself was young, it will be a miracle if I can get through this without screwing up all the names because of the proliferation. We're meant to mix these people up. We're meant to be confused by them because of uh, a reason that I will, uh, you know, sort of unveil in the third session. But this idea of Nina as being this mother, she's also uh, very closely named to the doll that, uh, that Leda had when she was young. So she had this doll named Mina. So Nina and Mina, obviously very, very close. And you're meant to conflate these two. You're meant to see this young mother, who is about half the age of Leda, as, um, you know, as, as, as sort of melting, kind of melding and melting together with this doll, because in some ways, um, well, not really with the doll, but with this idea of, of babies and of children and, uh, and of, of pregnancy and maternity. So you also have, um, so Elena then is, Elena is also the, the little girl. So the three-year-old girl is named Elena, which obviously is the first name of Elena Ferrante. So we're meant to also conflate the, our, our trusty author with this three-year-old child who is the daughter. So I think what you can argue, you know, pretty, pretty convincingly, given all the data that I have found in this book, that we are meant to see Elena Ferrante, sort of our, our author, as both 
the um, as the Leda character, and then certainly as the child. And she talks quite a bit about being a mother and a child at the same time. Okay. Also, um, the the three year old. So she it often. So Elena, a short name for Lena, Elena is Nena, and Nena, you know, obviously sounds very close to Nina. So you have all of these different, um, you know, these, these sort of, you know, proliferation of names. You even have the men's names that are all very similar. So her husband is uh, Gianni, and then Giovanni is uh, Nina's husband, and then Gino is the young man played by Paul Mescal in the movie, which I don't think I realized that at the time. I have to go back and rewatch it because um, Paul Mescal is really nice to watch on the screen. Okay, but, and I wanna read a little segment here about this proliferation of the names and how significant it is. On page 20 in the book here, for a while, I didn't know if it was the mother or the daughter who was called Nina, Ninu, Nina. The names were so many and I had trouble given the thick weave of sound arriving at any conclusion. So you have right away this idea of the mother and daughter as having sort of um, interchangeable names, largely because Elena takes the nickname Nena. So she's confusing the mother and the daughter in a way that is very significant. Mother and daughter are sort of still, you know, one being. And then a little further down, I don't know why I wrote those names in my notebook. Elena, Nani, Nena, Lenny, Maybe I liked the way Nina pronounced them. So again, you have this emphasis on maternal voice and you have this emphasis on the names as kind of all flowing together, which is very significant because largely this is an exploration of the extent to which daughters can in fact separate from their mothers. It's very significant too that Lita in, in this book has um, two daughters, she does not have a son. So these are daughters who, you know, they're children who essentially uh, have the capacity at least to become mothers themselves. Okay, then we have, this is, that's the proliferation of names. We also have the prol proliferation of actual mothers. So in the beginning, um, mothers and daughters and dolls and babies. So in the beginning, um, you know, we have this Leda and then on the scene quickly comes this large Neapolitan family that reminds her of her own large Neapolitan family that, that is sort of embarrassing for her. She looks down on them, certainly. Um, they arrive and here you have Nina and her three-year-old daughter. And in the beginning, they are kind of a, almost like a Madonna and child kind of a scene because there's no father evident yet, he does arrive, but you have this sense of, of her as being kind of this perfect uh, embodiment of motherhood and this baby as being this three-year-old who's pretty infantilized. She does, they talk about her regressing when she loses her baby doll, but she seems pretty young uh, even from the beginning. Uh, and then you have Rosaria, who is an older woman who is very pregnant. And um, you even have, so now you're having this prolifer proliferation of these pregnancies, and you even have Rosaria's brother, is Nina's husband. And he has this big, huge belly that looks to her like a pregnancy. And in fact, it is split down the center. So you have this sense almost of, of um, you know, like a, like a cesarean sort of a thing, even on a, on a man. And you have this, this presence over his shorts, uh, you know, sort of over the low slung shorts of this giant belly that, that seems very pregnancy-like to our narrator. Uh, okay, so and then you have the dolls, of course, you have Nani and the, the doll is Nani, the, the baby doll, the like creepy baby doll is Nani, which is very close to Nina, the mom. It's an anagram of Nina, so it's just a rearranging of the letters. It's also, of course, very close to uh, Mina, which is the name of the doll uh, that Leda had when she was a child. So there's even a thing where at one point Lita says that she herself became Bianca's doll when, when she was a very young mother and she had these two young girls. She was so overwhelmed and, and just desperate and, and really you know, tired and exhausted all the time. And, so, and also because she felt like she never had any sort of access to her mother's body, she wanted to provide that access to Bianca. And so she says, I became Bianca's doll. But then, of course, Bianca, you know, pulls too hard on her hair while she's combing her hair, and then that leads to all sorts of all sorts of problems. Uh, okay, so we're gonna look quickly at page. Oh no, we already looked at page twenty. So we're gonna move on um, and talk about the creepiness. So we're gonna look first of all 
at the concept that this is a this is a novel. It's not, well, it's a novella. It's a short novel about. It's literally about a woman in Italy who goes to the seashore for a vacation and she steals a baby doll, and then she gets in like a fender bender. That's the whole thing. Like it's just there's just not there's not a lot of um, you know there's not a lot of like obvious stuff happening, and yet there is so much tension and so much kind of um, uh, like. Like, uh, I mean, it's just such a page turner. It's really uh, very tense and I think very well done. So first, we are gonna look at these aspects that are just kind of creepy in terms of description. So we look at page 14. Okay, so she's just settling in. We're on page 14, we're a few pages in. She's just moving into her little apartment. I discovered, this is so gross. I discovered that under the beautiful show figs, Pears, prunes, peaches, grapes were overripe or rotten. I took out a knife and cut off large black areas, but the smell disgusted me, the taste, and I threw almost all of it into the garbage. So she goes and she finds this beautiful bowl of fruit that someone has left for her, and yet it's all like blackened and gross. And it's such a weird description too, because she says, you know, you have this beautiful thing at the top. Um, the prunes, peaches, grapes were overripe or rotten. I took out a knife and cut off large black areas. I'm like, why are you eating this? Like gross. I mean, I'm actually very comfortable with all kinds of like overripe fruit, but not if you're cutting off large black areas. Then she says, but the smell disgusted me, the taste. And I threw away, I threw almost all of it in the garbage. So this idea of, um, but the smell disgusted me. So I'd be like, okay, if the smell is disgusting you, then definitely don't eat it. And then the taste, like then she's eating it. So on some level, this woman is really um, a bit unhinged. Like we're a little bit like, hmm, I'm not, or, or she's in a lot of pain, I guess is another way to look at it, a slightly more charitable way to look at it. So on that same page, after this kind of upsetting thing where something that looked very beautiful from the outside was in fact rotten, um, which yuck, and also describes actually maybe like a lot of resort places and a lot of summer plans. That's very pessimistic, but maybe true. Um, and then down here a little bit more on the same page, we have this. I turned on the light. On the bright white material of the pillowcase was an insect, three or four centimeters long, like a giant fly. It was dark brown and motionless with membranous wings. I said to myself, it's a cicada. Maybe its abdomen burst on my pillow. I touched it with the hem of my bathrobe. It moved and became immediately quiet male, female. The stomach of the females doesn't have elastic membranes. It doesn't sing. It's mute. I felt disgust. Okay, so this is so, so first of all, I looked at a picture of a cicada because I wanted to know if it looked like an enormous fly and they are so gross. They have red eyes at the top and they do look like a big fly. I mean, gross. Just, I mean, I, I thought they would be pretty. For some reason, I thought, I actually don't think cockroaches, live cockroaches are disgusting, but like like that amber color of the cockroach is just like not that bad. These are disgusting. And I like the noise of cicadas. So I was really kind of bummed out to learn that in fact, they look like giant flies, but with red eyes and, and the wings are membranous. They're like, they're like, you can see through them. Um, but then it's very significant when she says, I said to myself, it's a cicada. Maybe it's abdomen burst on my pillow. Like, then you're like, is there something gross on the pillow? And later we have lots of fluids that are coming out of this doll, which are also creepy. But so you have the idea of some sort of evidence uh, or some sort of like spot or something on her pillow. But also in retrospect, I did not notice this the first time around, the idea of the abdomen exploding is, or exploding, she doesn't say exploding, um, burst. The idea of a burst abdomen is this idea of, of a pregnancy. It's idea of something bursting out of the abdomen. So you have this idea even of, of this um, insect as being somehow pregnant with something. Okay, and then we move on. Um, this When she touches it with her bathrobe, and then it says, um, it moved and became immediately quiet. So I really wanted to look at the translation here. I think what it means is that it moved and stopped making noise, which would have meant that it was a male um, because then she goes on and talks about how the females are mute, which of course is very significant because the, the females being mute is speaking to the fact that women generally don't have voices in the same way that men do. So you have this sense of um, it, it, this, this 
like there's a question well partially again i think this has to do with the translation i think that there i think if um it it, it, it when it immediately became quiet after it moved i thought it meant it stopped moving but it meant i think that the sound stopped so then down even a little bit further i cautiously picked up the pillow went to one of the windows and tossed the insect out that was how my vk well I cautiously picked up the pillow, went to one of the windows and tossed the insect out. That was how my vacation began. So we have this like kind of traumatic page of all this rotten, gross stuff and insects, you know, on pillows with their abdomens bursting. And at the bottom, we have this very concise, that was how my vacation began. So you have all of these ominous things, even in that very first paragraph, and then they, they carry on. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next creepy thing on page 27. So this is, this, this is important. Um, and this was something, it's so interesting how much this grossed me out, which is weird. Let me read it to you. This is when she's on the beach and she sees Nina and the daughter Elena. She moves closer in large part so that she can see them more closely. For the first time, I saw her up close. She seemed to me less beautiful, not as young. The waxing at her groin had been done badly. The child she held in her arms had a red, runny eye, a forehead pimpled with sweat, and the doll was ugly and dirty. I returned to my place, outwardly calm, but in fact, extremely agitated. So you have this, I mean, there's something about eyes. There's something about children's eyes and like, I don't know, pink eye and eye infections that are particularly like, Ugh. And, and this idea, like at one point she has a runny nose, but this runny eye in particular and, and the pimpled forehead, um, you know, this, this is a child who later has a fever, but the idea also of the, um, so when you're imagining this bikini line that has not been waxed well, what you would have there would be, you know, like little ingrown hairs. Um, and it's a very kind of sexualized thing. Like this woman, our trusty narrator is noticing, you know, the crotch area of this woman. And she's noticing, in fact, that there would be some ingrown hairs. And there's a real similarity, because we're not given a ton of details, there's a similarity between that area of the groin on the mom and the forehead of the baby, which, you know, you can imagine like a delivery, you can imagine like a weird contagion, like there's all sorts of, I mean, these images are kind of already creepy enough. And then when you dig into them a little bit, you realize how well sort of structured they are and, and all of the kind of implications here about this kind of this bumpiness that you see in the vaginal area of the woman and across the head, you know, the crown of the head of the baby. It's also just, um, there, there's a sexualized piece of the entire book. I mentioned uh, how sexualized the cover was. And it's interesting, Mag Maggie Gyllenhaal did not really lean heavily into that, which is probably, I think maybe for the best, it was already, the movie was already complex enough. Um, but you do have, at one point, the little baby, uh, the three-year-old, is has her doll and is pushing the doll between her legs. And it's kind of, you have a sense of, with her, the face of the doll into her vagina. So you have the sense of, of her as, as both sort of um, trying to like return the baby to her womb, but then also there's like a weird sexual overtone there. So it's a, um, th this is signaling to us even here on page 27, that, that there is this kind of sexualized preoccupation on the part of our narrator. Okay, we're gonna look at page 33 for another little creepy moment. Oh, you know what? We're going to skip this one. This is, she just goes to a bar and she looks for something to eat. And there's a swarm of flies in the, in the like deli case there, which is so gross. The idea of a swarm of flies is so many and it's so active. Like it just seems so repellent. Uh, and then she just goes ahead and has two croquettes and you, it's not clear if she's getting them out of this deli case sort of seemed like the only source of food. But this swarm of flies, not only is it gross, but it also echoes the cicadas who we see throughout the entire, uh, the entire book. Okay, we're gonna look at page 62, just for the sake of time. I can't really touch on all the creepiness. Okay, and then uh, we are going to read A, let's see down here at the very bottom of 62. So this is when she has the doll. So she has taken the doll, very quickly, the, the little girl loses the doll and um, she's very upset because she hasn't found the doll. And then as Lita, 
uh, the little girl is also lost and everyone's in turmoil because they can't find the little girl. And it's actually Lita who finds the little girl and the family is is happy because the the child has not drowned, the ch which is like we saw that you know um, presaged in the very beginning. The child hasn't drowned, but the child is totally disconsolate because she cannot find her doll. Then, oh, I'm in the second section. I can give you a spoiler. Okay, woo. Um, and then when she's leaving, you find that she has the doll in her purse. Lita has taken the doll. I mean, it's so creepy, and she doesn't even know why. She can't understand why. She knows she did it but she can't understand why. So then she goes home and she has this doll with her. I understood clearly that I didn't want to give Nani back, even though I felt remorse, fear in keeping her with me. I kissed her face, her mouth. I hugged her as I had seen Elena do. She emitted a gurgle that seemed to me a hostile remark and with it a jet of brown saliva that dirtied my lips and my shirt. I mean, gross. So this also this notion of um, a gurgle that sounded uh, like a hostile remark. So she really is like imbuing a certain sort of voice in into this baby doll. And this baby doll is filled with with this kind of gross stuff. We're going to look at page 85 to get a little better sense of the gross stuff that's inside the baby. Um, so down here on the bottom of page 85, I examined her lips, pursed around a small opening. They were of a plastic softer than the rest of the body and yielded under my fingers. I parted them delicately. So the idea of lips, you know, it's obviously very vaginal as well. And because it's the mouth, it's also the source of the voice. So this is a, um, all of these interactions with the doll are very highly charged because they have to do both with sexuality, which is really in the forefront of this book, but also a, a voice. I parted them delicately. The opening widened and the doll smiled, showing me gums and baby teeth. So creepy. Also the doll smiling is it's the, the doll has agency. At one point the doll is out on the, um, like out on the balcony on the terrace and it looks like she sticks her tongue out at Lita. So there are all these kinds of things where She's, I don't think Lita can be categorized as like a, a an unreliable narrator, but she's definitely someone who is has a slightly tenuous uh, handle on reality, at least the reality of baby dolls. Okay, uh, the doll smiled, showing me gums and baby teeth. I closed, which also I, I have owned many, many a baby doll in my time, and I haven't had any that you could pull the lips apart and see, um, you know, gums and baby teeth. I closed the mouth immediately in revulsion, shook her hard. I could hear the water in her belly and imagined a stomach of filth, a stale, stagnant liquid mixed with sand. This is yours, mother and daughter, I thought. Why did I interfere? So we have this idea of the baby as, as, have, as being full of something. And in fact, it is full. We are going to look at um, this next part. Oh, no, wait. Um, we're, oh. That's, we're going to talk about in the third part what is what's actually in the baby. That's a little bit of a cliffhanger there. Tune into part three. Make sure you listen to find out what's in the belly of the baby. Uh, but so that those are kind of the gross things, the creepy things that we're going to talk about. There's an incident that happens where there's this very mysterious thing where she gets hit in the back by a pine cone. And the question is, she has always loved pine forests. She loves the smell of resin. There's a really nice sense of place in this book. It's a little creepy, but you definitely get a sense of this beach, you know, this beachside resort. So, um, but there's this pine cone incident where it's not clear if it has fallen off of a tree or if someone has thrown it at her, but there is like a lot of scuffling in the bushes and she's feeling watched. So we don't know if this is her paranoia or if this is nature, it's not clear, but she is left with this, um, with this giant, like mark on her back that also um is it's really interesting the description of it is very vaginal it looks like a mouth and it has sort of brown and it's kind of livid in the middle livid meaning kind of whitish kind of pale so you do have a sense of it as looking like a mouth but also of course looking like a vagina so there, there's all sorts of layers to this idea um and rosaria actually who's the really pregnant woman in fact, uh, offers her this ointment and she puts this ointment on her back, which does in fact make it feel better. She also takes a swim in the ocean and you should keep in mind that the ocean often is uh, aligned with the moon and aligned with kind of women in general, like 
the ocean is often seen as this kind of motherly, uh, you know, source of life for obvious reasons, but also because of the lunar calendar and women's menstruation. So when she's bathing in the ocean, you know, it's very much like a return to kind of the amniotic sac kind of a, a moment. Think of all the things we haven't had a chance to, to talk about. I mean, this book is rife with all sorts of stuff that we don't have time to dive into. Okay. Um, we're going to just very briefly talk to you about, um, th there are a bunch of different references that she, she has these kind of quick little drops. Like she said at one point, something was off about the girl, or at one point she's talking about the terrible things that are happening with her mother. There are lots of very short sort of dipping into a concept and then, and then leaving quickly in the way that you would notice something. And then it's either sort of built upon or it stands alone. And yet they're all very ominous. There's also, the word choice is incredible. So um, words like violent comes up again and again and again and violence itself. The word violet, also the color comes up quite a bit. And I meant to check to see in Italian if violet is as close to violence as it is in English. I would imagine it is because I, you know, it sounds like it. Um, so, but also words like repugnance and repelled and revulsion and distress and distressed and uh, disgust and disgusting and anxiety and uh, scuffling. Somebody was scuffling in the pine forest when she got hit in the back. Clamor, muttering. They're all of these words that are, even just the words themselves are really ominous in ways, if I had a lot more time, I would love to dig into you know, either the Latin you know, etymology or, or the nuances of, of the translation here. But the word choice itself in a book that's fairly spare and not very long is really impactful. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for tuning in to this second section of our three-part lecture on Elena Ferrante's The Lost Daughter. Please join us for the third where we really unpack some of the larger meaning. We're gonna talk more about the doll. We're gonna talk about the larger message behind all the creepy weirdness. And then we will look at the close of the novel in a way that, that will sort of point to this circularity in the book that I found, I didn't notice it the first time I read it and then just was really taken by the idea of going back to the beginning and rereading. So join us for part three of the three-part session, uh, the three-part lecture, whenever you can. Happy reading.